How many times we fail to look beyond the bread, beyond the miller, beyond the farmer, beyond the sun and the rain to the hand of God. But thanksgiving sees beyond the second causes to that great first cause, which is the hand and heart of God. From Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, this is the Coral Ridge Hour. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the fourth chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians, Philippians chapter four, beginning with verse four. Some familiar words, I hope that many of you have hidden them in your heart. If you have, you, your life has been blessed. Philippians four, four, the inspired word of the living God. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And may God speak to us today through this his holy word and bless our lives with it. In Christ's name, amen. Do you remember when you were a child? Some of you still are. And you read stories about great magicians with magic wands that accomplished incredible things. You remember the fairy godmother in Cinderella that turned a ragged, filthy old dress into a beautiful gown and worn shoes into glass slippers, a pumpkin into a handsome carriage, and mice into prancing horses, all 
with a wave of that magic wand. Did you ever wish that you had one of those? Well, it would be nice, wouldn't it? Well, God has actually given us something like that. And I would like to talk to you today about the Christian's magic wand. And it is gratitude. It can transform your life. Gratitude is something that we preach about, something we talk about, and yet, though it is the ornament of oratory, it is often absent from our practical lives. But consider today what it can accomplish in yours. Thanksgiving, or gratitude, and thanksgiving is but the outward expression of the inward attitude of gratitude. It can, first of all, transform anxiety and worry into peace. Are you anxious today? Is your heart filled with worry? Well, with the magic wand of gratitude, that can be transformed. The text that we read today says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I recall one time my wife Anne shared with me the experience that she had had that day. It was one of those days when she had more things to do than she could possibly get done and she was getting a little nervous about it, particularly because the phone never stopped ringing. I don't know if you know it or not, but on an average day, the phone in the parsonage rings every 17 seconds. And when you have a heavy schedule already, that can make it very hectic, especially when you want to be very nice and friendly and sound like there's no problem to those that are calling. And uh, she got farther and farther behind and became more anxious about the day. And then she remembered that one of the things she had to do was to call her prayer partners for evangelism explosion and share with them the results and pray with them. And as she was praying with one of these ladies and thanking God for all that he had done through this ministry and in the life of someone they'd visited that week and what wonderful things he had wrought in changing the hearts of people and how she was thankful to him for her prayer partners, when she hung up the phone, she told me that she suddenly realized that all of her anxiety and panic and worry were gone. And I said, isn't that interesting? What do you know? It works just like God said it will work. It is a magic wand that transforms anxiety into peace. Well, how does it do that? Why does it work that way? Well, do you remember the familiar song, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. And by the time you get through counting all of your blessings, naming them one by one, and thanking God for each thing that he has done for you, and by the way, on our best days, in our best efforts, we don't come close to thanking God for all that he has done. But by the time you get through with that effort, you will discover that if God has done so much for you and blessed you in so many ways, surely there's no need to be anxious about anything. Truly, that wand of thanksgiving is magical and can change anxiety into peace. Secondly, if life seems boring and dull, well, use the magic wand of thanksgiving and you will discover that it can transform the commonplace into the sacred. 
a world that is transformed by the presence of God. Now the world is constantly engaged in trying to banish God from as much of his world as they possibly can. And they've done a pretty good job so far in dividing, as they always do, the world into the sacred and the secular and trying to more and more restrict the sacred. If they had their way, it would be limited merely to your closet and your bedroom and it would not ever come out to disturb their godless sleep. But for the Christian, such a thing as that is impossible because we recognize no such dichotomy as the secular and the sacred. This is my Father's world, and therefore all of it is sacred. Everything about it is sacred. It doesn't matter whether we are eating or sleeping or playing or working. Everything that we do is sacred in the Christian life because it all comes from God. The fullness of this world is Him. And thanksgiving can remind us that everything comes from God. That as soon as we begin to give thanks, we realize suddenly that God is there wherever we are and that all of a sudden we find ourselves in an enchanted land, in a divine land, a land that is fraught with the fragrance of our Redeemer. And our spiritual eyes are open and our hearts are filled because in the hour of thankfulness, faith is full and everything is changed. Suddenly, the commonplace wears a halo. The ordinary has a nimbus about it. And even our work is seen as divine service. A conversation becomes koinonia, a fellowship with God. And a night's rest is a nestling down with angels. Everything is suffused with the divine presence and suddenly everything is changed, all by the power of that magical wand of thanksgiving. William Paley, one of the great apologists for the Christian faith, said that the reason that so many people are not grateful and are insensi insensible to the goodness of our Creator is not because of the paucity of his blessings, but rather it is because of the vast extensiveness of his bounty. God is so good to us in so many ways that we fail to see his hand at work. Consider this. Suppose we take a commonplace occurrence that happens every day in this nation and happened to some of our own members this week the birth of a baby. Suppose, for example, that God had created everyone in the world at once and as adults, and that a baby had never, ever been born. And then suddenly, one day, a woman gave birth to a baby. Imagine it. It would be on the front page of every newspaper in the world it would be considered a miracle. And of course, in a sense, it certainly is, even now. It would be such an astonishing thing that people would certainly see the hand of God involved in such a thing as that. Or suppose, again, that we lived in a world in which there were no flowers of any kind. And certainly, we could have had a world without flowers. And then one day, suddenly, in a certain place, something bloomed on a plant. It was a rose, something that had never been seen before in the history of the world. It would be an astonishment why somebody would no doubt have put a fence around it and be charging admission for people to come and see it. It would be a wonder. 
and yet we pass by such phenomena every day and few of us stop to smell the flowers or enjoy the sight because God is so good. Suppose we lived in a world where there was no flour, no wheat, no bread, no one that had ever tasted bread. Then suddenly some started to grow and it was made into flour and baked into bread and warmed and heated and served hot with butter it would be considered absolutely the most astonishing thing. And yet, many of us had it for breakfast and hardly gave it any thought at all. You see, one reason for our ingratitude is not the paucity of God's gifts. It is the superabundance of them that we do not even realize how blessed we are. How many times we fail to look beyond the bread, beyond the miller, beyond the farmer, beyond the sun and the rain to the hand of God. But thanksgiving sees beyond the second causes to that great first cause, which is the hand and heart of God. I remember a couple of years ago, I heard I didn't see, I'm happy to say, and have never watched the first episode of The Simpsons in the fall, and they were having a meal. Yes, I realize these are cartoon characters, but somebody wrote it, somebody produced it, somebody directed it, some people allowed it and endorsed it, and uh, they were getting ready to give thanks. And uh, one of them said, why should we give thanks to God? We earned the money, we bought the bread or whatever, the food, we cooked it, we served it. What do we got to thank him for? Obviously, the writer could see nothing beyond the second causes of human endeavor. And without the hand of God, there would be no food of any sort. And so thanksgiving can transform the commonplace into that which is sacred and diffused with the presence of God. Thirdly, the magic wand of thanksgiving can transform temptation and defeat into victory. You will recall that in the first chapter of the book of Romans, where the Apostle Paul catalogs the decline of mankind into the gross depravity of sin, that after declaring that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, he then says, and neither were they thankful. And then the precipitous decline into the most gross sins which, by the way, began with male and female homosexuality, went on. As someone said, an ungrateful person is only one step away from getting their needs met in illegitimate ways. You would never be tempted or commit adultery if you were really grateful for your spouse. You would not be tempted to steal if you were really grateful for what you had. You would not be envious of others' talents and abilities if you were grateful for those which God had given you. You would not be proud if you were thankful. You see, pride short circuits thankfulness. It cuts it off right at the individual. You remember Edith, I trust. It was described as by one author as a small country bounded on the north, south, east, and west by Edith. And therefore, anything that flowed into Edith came no doubt from north or east Edith, and she had nothing to be grateful for. The proud person is not a grateful person. 
And so the magic wand of thanksgiving can transform temptation into victory. And fourthly, that same magic wand can transform, transform a despondent and discouraged person into a confident and happy person. A woman was very depressed at Thanksgiving time because she had lost her husband and she felt that life now held nothing for her. And then someone came to her and said, you know, I am so thankful to God for you. And suddenly, this woman's life was changed. She realized that she still was needed, that there was still something in life for her to do, and her despondency vanished because of someone else's thankfulness. But that same thankfulness can do the same thing for us. Are you discouraged? Are you despondent? You say, well, if, if you had my problems, you would be too. Well, let me tell you about a lady who probably had more than any of us here. When she was just a little girl, her father died, leaving her to her mother to care for her. When she was six weeks old, a careless doctor made a foolish mistake which left her blind for life. And this tragic and traumatic experience, says Nancy Lee DeMoss, would have made most people bitter and despondent. But surprisingly enough, it was not that way with her. In her autobiography, Frances Jane, whom we know as Fanny, Crosby said this, it seemed intended by the blessed providence of God that I should be blind all my life and I thank him for the dispensation. The doctor who destroyed her sight never forgave himself. In fact, he moved out of town because he couldn't face the fact of what he's done. But listen to what Fanny Crosby Fanny Crosby, of course, was a great blind hymnist. And by the way, there's hardly a, a hymn that she wrote that doesn't make some reference to sight. And uh, she said this, if I could meet him now, the doctor who blinded her at six weeks, she said, I would say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, over and over again for making me blind. that blindness that many would consider as a curse, she considered as a gift from God. Because she said, if I were hindered by the distractions of seeing all of the interesting and beautiful objects that would be presented to me, I never would have been able to write the thousands of hymns that she wrote. Isn't that incredible? I think she wrote eight or 9,000 hymns. When she was only eight years old, she wrote her first poem. This is the poem of an eight-year-old blind girl. Oh, what a happy child I am. Do you have problems? Oh, what a happy child I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. So weep or sigh because I'm blind. I cannot, nor I won't. And so she has blessed the lives of countless millions of people with Songs like, to God be the glory, great things he has done, or blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. All the way my Savior leads me, and countless, countless others. 
And it was all due to her gratitude to God for the blessings that he had given to her. Truly, thanksgiving can transform the greatest of sorrows and despondencies and tragedies into a happy and rejoicing heart. In Central Africa, they have a habit among the Christian community that I think is interesting. Whenever they meet another Christian, they don't say, good morning or how are you? They say, thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. When I read that, I thought that some of you won't understand that. And some of you don't. I can tell by your faces. But they're thankful for all their brothers and sisters in Christ who make up that wonderful family of God in which we are so interdependent upon one another for the blessings that we have. How many people have blessed your life and how seldom do some people ever tell them about it? Everybody needs encouragement. I wonder when the last time you told anyone that you were thankful to God for them. You know, <clears throat> large-souled people are people who are grateful. And small-souled people are people who are not. And they seldom or ever express their gratitude and thankfulness to anyone for anything. I think they are certainly to be pitied, uh, perhaps to be pitied almost as much as those who have to live with them. Are you a large-souled person, a grateful soul? Do you look for things to be thankful for? Are you truly thankful? Is there a, an attitude of gratitude that underlines the words of your lips and gives them meeting, meaning? May I say finally, lastly, fifthly, that gratitude and thankfulness are a magic wand that can transform acquaintances into friends and bind people to you with the steel hoops of gratitude. People love to hear an expression of gratitude for what you've meant to them. Do you realize how dependent we are on so many people for the good things of this life? How often do you express it? If you would have friends, be grateful. And thus, gratitude can transform a lonely person into a person that has friends. The ungrateful person rarely has any friends at all. Because the ungrateful person is fixated upon himself and not upon the expression of gratitude to anyone else. If you would want to transform a lonely knife into a life full of friendship, try the magic wand of thankfulness. And I might add here that in this expression of thankfulness, which first of all is to God and then to others who are his second causes, one prayer that I've always noted is a prayer of a Christian, but never the prayer of one who is not. I would ask you this question, and it's a question which will reveal whether or not you really are a Christian. Have you ever prayed, I thank you, Lord, for the gift of eternal life? I thank you, Lord, for the gift that you have given me of heaven. O 
only a Christian can pray that prayer. Only a Christian like Fanny Crosby could write, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. The reason for that is very simple. You can't be thankful for what you don't know that you have. And in case some of you don't even know this, you can know that you do have eternal life and you can only know it when you realize that it is free. It is a gift. It was paid for at infinite cost by our Savior and offered freely to those who would receive him as Lord and Savior of their heart and trust in him alone for their salvation. Have you received that gift? If not, I would urge you to go to Christ right now and ask him to fill your heart with that joy that comes to those who have placed their trust in him and have accepted him as Savior and Lord and have received that free gift of eternal life. If so, this afternoon, when you eat that turkey, you can be truly thankful to God, not only for that, but for that foretaste of the glories that are yet to come. Otherwise, if you don't receive him, you'll be the turkey. <laughs> May we pray. Father, forgive us for our little gratitude for our lack of thanksgiving to you and to others. We thank thee this day, O God, those who have received it for the gift of everlasting life. And for those who have not, I pray that your spirit will enable them to say right now, Lord Jesus Christ, I do want that gift of eternal life. I realize that I am not worthy of it and never can be, but I accept it freely as a gift from you, paid for by Christ. Come into my heart and live your life in me and make me a grateful person for all of your bounties. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Hello, I'm Rob Pacienza, the senior pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church founded by Dr. D. James Kennedy. Did you pray with Dr. Kennedy, asking for that gift of eternal life? If so, you can be grateful that Jesus Christ is now your Savior and your Lord. And we have a special gift we'd like to send you to help you begin to grow in your new faith. It's beginning again. The book Dr. Kennedy wrote for new believers. You'll find answers to some of the questions you may have, as well as tips on how to pray and how to read your Bible. We'd love to send it to you when you write to us or call our toll-free number. Just ask for Beginning Again. And may God richly bless you in your new life in Christ. This is the weekend before Thanksgiving. And as we prepare our hearts to give thanks to God for all that we have and all that we have received, I want us to take a moment to remember those who celebrated the first Thanksgiving on these shores. If not for the bravery and the Christian faith of the pilgrims, there would be no America and there would be no Thanksgiving. Of Plymouth Plantation, Chapter 1. It is well known unto the godly how ever since the first breaking out of the light of the gospel in our honorable nation of England, Satan hath raised, maintained, and continued wars and oppositions against the saints. Our story begins with the recollections of Governor William Bradford in his classic memoir entitled, Of Plymouth Plantation. For Bradford and the others who eventually came to the shores of America, the pilgrim adventure began in 17th century England on a rather unhappy note. 
The political climate in King James, England, for one who didn't strictly abide by the Church of England, was at best perilous. I will make them conform, proclaimed King James, or I will harry them out of the land. Historian and direct pilgrim descendant, Dr. Robert Bartlett. And it was against the law to have any kind of a religious meeting secret, separate from the Church of England, or even to read the Bible in, in public. Those are criminal offenses. He and his loyal men persecuted all nonconformists, including a small group of Christians that formed a congregation in central England in the sleepy town of Scrooby. This particular group had formed a tight-knit congregation by making a binding covenant in 1606. Paul Jaley, an expert on pilgrim history, explains the significance of this covenant. But it was a covenant that they all agreed to have their lives exposed one to another, whatever it should cost them, that they were going to walk in unity and purity of the gospel, as Bradford would have phrased. And this Scrooby congregation uh, got its identity at that time. Because of the mounting dangers for all nonconformists, and for fear that the king might disband their group, Pastor John Robinson and the members of the Scrooby congregation prayerfully decided to seek refuge in Holland, which at the time offered a place of refuge for those seeking religious freedom. Initially in Amsterdam and soon thereafter in Leiden, the pilgrims enjoyed a peaceful time of spiritual growth. But after more than 10 years there, year upon year of hard physical labor for all family members, of 14-hour workdays, of struggling in a foreign language, caused the pilgrims and their children to consider leaving Holland. They felt that their children had to do almost a full day's work as a young child in order to help with the family, and they were growing old in their youth. Plus, the young people were learning the Dutch ways, were being corrupted, and last, they said their desire to come was to be a stepping stone unto spreading the gospel and the kingdom of Christ unto the remote parts of the world. There was a strong sense in them of wanting to bring the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth, to the distant Speaker and author, parts of the Peter world. Marshall. They wanted to be used of God to really bring the good news of Jesus Christ to parts of the world that had not been evangelized. Chapter 5. After our humble prayers unto God for His direction and assistance, and a general conference held hereabout, we consulted what particular place to pitch upon and prepare for. They set their sights on the shores of North America, believing here that they might indeed establish a community based on the Word of God. They finally decided to settle in the northern parts of Virginia, which in those days meant near the mouth of the Hudson. To finance such a venture, they found some sympathetic London businessmen willing to lend them the money for the costly move. By this time, the Scrooby congregation numbered about 300, and it was decided that only about 50 of them would go in the first major trip to the New World. They purchased a small boat for the expedition, the Speedwell, to supplement the main boat that they rented. They secured the services of the crew and ship, the Mayflower, a cargo boat that normally carried wine. But the Speedwell proved unseaworthy, so a number of those from the ill-fated ship crammed into the already crowded Mayflower. Finally, the Mayflower alone set sail from Plymouth, England on September 6th, and they entrusted themselves to God, thanking Him for the good as well as for the bad. Chapter 9 After we had enjoyed fair winds and weather for a season, we were encountered many times with cross winds and met with many fierce storms with which the ship was wickedly shaken. The voyage of the Mayflower was an incredible ordeal. They had 102 people for basically two months crammed into the, what they called the tween decks, which was one of the, car the cargo space on this leaky old freighter, the Mayflower. Five and a half feet of headroom, maybe 25 feet wide, about 90 feet long, something like that. 102 men, women, and children. The pilgrims calmed their fears by singing hymns and praying but this caused some of the crew to mock and jeer them. One man in particular was a ringleader of this mocking. He would always be condemning us and cursing us daily with grievous execrations. But it pleased God before we came half seas over to smite this young man with some grievous disease of which he died. The attitude of the ship's crew changed totally. 
after this man's death. They got the message. And the pilgrims, again, the grace of God in these people, the love of Jesus that was in them, the pilgrims held a, a little small burial service for, for this man who had persecuted them at sea. It was on November 9th, 66 days later, that they first sighted land off of Cape Cod. Since they were sailing to the northern part of Virginia, they realized they had been blown off course, but their attempts to sail south were completely hindered by dangerous shoals along the coast. They interpreted this as the hand of God guiding them to stay there. So they remained in Cape Cod and landed on the province town tip. Being thus arrived in a good harbor, and brought safe to land, we fell upon our knees and blessed the God of heaven, who had brought us over the vast and furious ocean and delivered us from all the perils and miseries thereof, again to set our feet upon the firm and stable earth. For the next few days they explored the Cape Cod coast to find a place to settle. Since they were not in Virginia, and therefore technically not under any government's jurisdiction, some of the non-separatists aboard talked of leaving the pilgrims and striking out on their own. Bradford and the others realized this would be disastrous. Each man's skill was necessary for the survival of the community. So the pilgrims, mindful of the covenant that had held them together for the past 14 years, wrote up a similar covenant which committed one man to another for the good and preservation of them all. Unlike the incomplete version cited in some modern textbooks, the original Mayflower Compact made the Pilgrim's purpose abundantly clear. Having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do buy these presents. With the foundational framework for the colony laid, they turned their attention to finding the most conducive place to settle, they found a protected harbor which had been cleared by Indians a number of years earlier. These Indians had tragically been wiped out by a plague. The pilgrims named the clearing Plymouth. Being the middle of winter in a harsh land, they now had to go about the business of survival in their new home. That first winter, nearly half their number died of disease, but it was their faith that sustained them through this the greatest of the difficulties they would face. When the Mayflower went back in April, there wasn't a single one of 51 surviving pilgrims that got aboard and went back. It showed, in spite of their hardships, they were still sold on their, their enterprise and were hopeful that they were going to make it. With the coming of spring, with half their number dead, and with little food among them, the pilgrims were in desperate straits. But then in their time of great need, nothing short of a miracle took place. An Indian named Squanto came to the colony. As a young man, Squanto had been captured and taken to England. While there, he mastered the English language. Years later, and by the providence of God, he returned to America only to find his tribe wiped out completely by a plague. This is miraculously the very tribe that occupied the land where the pilgrims had now settled. Squanto turned out to be the pilgrim's key to survival. They had no more idea how to live in this wilderness than fly to the moon. Squanto taught them how to trap eels in the mud flats when the tide went out, what berries were edible, all the Indian lore. Most importantly, he taught them how to plant the Indians' winter staple, corn, which Europeans had known nothing about until they came to America. Squanto continued with us and was our interpreter and was a special instrument sent of God for our good beyond our expectation. During the fall, after the harvest, the pilgrims were joined by the Indians for a mutual feast, a feast to give thanks to God for protecting them and providing for them so graciously, the first Thanksgiving. Thanks to God, the small colony from Scrooby, England, was to survive. The worst days behind them, the pilgrims were able to build a small but moderately successful colony where the Bible and the church were the hub of their lives. More of their number from back in Holland were able to immigrate to Plymouth and their population grew steadily. All the while, the pilgrims worked diligently to pay back their investors.
and as one small candle may light a thousand, so the light here kindled has shown unto many in some sort to a whole nation that the glorious name of Jehovah have all the praise. Start every day with new every morning. This newly revised and newly printed daily devotional is one of the most beloved and enduring works of Dr. D. James Kennedy and Dr. Jerry Newcomb. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Find inspiration in the pages of New Every Morning through heart-stirring meditations that address the issues most critical to believers today to help us draw closer to God, understand Scripture more clearly, and apply it to our lives. Contact us today to receive your copy of New Every Morning so that you can enjoy the biblical, spiritual nourishment found in this daily devotional. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.